And um, <laughs> this is the first of the intellectual journeys that we've had an opportunity to, to organize. And Greg deserves the credit uh, for contacting our guest, uh, Dr. John Slaughter, and inviting him to participate. So I'm going to turn it over to Greg and thank him for his service uh, to the Retired Faculty Association. Well, thank you, Jerry, and <laughs> for talking about service to the Retired Faculty Association. Jerry and Jeanette are, are just wonderful. Um, so uh, welcome to everyone. Uh, thank you so much for coming to what we hope is going to be a regular uh, uh, series. Um, the, the whole idea of intellectual journeys really is that people who are at the late stages of their career have a huge amount of experience and also very interesting stories about how they got to where they are. Uh, I, I don't know how many people really in their 20s could have predicted that they would end up where they are. And what that means is really that uh, also that uh, um, we faculty and staff see each other and get to know each other often in very professional ways. But we're rarely aware that behind each of those people is a very interesting story. And it was really to elicit that, that we uh, set up um, uh, this program, hoping that we'll all get to know one another better, uh, but also hoping that this will interest uh, young faculty who are starting their careers, uh, as uh, Jeanette said, uh, also be an inspiration to graduate students and undergraduates uh, when they hear how some of these people got to where they are. And uh, I want to thank John Slaughter for agreeing to be our first speaker. Um, and I want to give, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this because I want to give him a chance to talk and then throw this open to questions and answers. Our format is going to be very informal and really um, it's, it's up to you to ask questions. But I would like to set up a kind of framework um, by just describing uh, John's very rich and very diverse career, just giving you the facts and, and letting him talk about how he, how he did this. Um, John Slaughter, as I'm sure you know, is, um, uh, is the, uh, a university professor and dean's professor of education and engineering. It's an interesting combination of fields, and I gather from his CV and, and uh, what was on the web that he brings them together by really working on issues surrounding um, how to increase minority participation in engineering and the sciences. And uh, that is one of, I think, the light motifs of, of his career. Um, he received his uh, uh, BA, um, BS rather, in electrical engineering from Kansas State University, his MS in engineering from UCLA, and his PhD in engineering from UC San Diego. He began his career uh, uh, working as an electronics engineer for General Dynamics Corporation, uh, moved then to the U.S. Navy Electronics Laboratory Center in San Diego, where he was the department head for information systems and technology, um, then went to the University of Washington to be director of the Applied Physics Lab and uh, professor of electrical engineering. Uh, after that, uh, went to the National Science Foundation where he was assistant director for astronomical atmospheric earth and ocean sciences. Um, he became, served for a year as academic vice president and provost at Washington State University, um, but then became the director of the National Science Foundation. Um, after that, he became chancellor of the uh, University of Maryland at College Park, and then president of Occidental College. And he was, well, he was president that I first heard of him. 
uh, and heard of the wonderful job he did at diversifying uh, Occidental College and turning it into one of the most diverse liberal arts colleges in the country. And this was in the 1990s when many places were understanding that they needed to do something about diversity, but not quite sure how to do it. And John was already doing it. Um, uh, he then became president and CEO of the National Action Council for Minorities in Engineering and is now, uh, as I say, uh, university professor and dean's professor at USC. I won't bore you with all of his um, honorary degrees, that would take most of our time, or his awards, which take up uh, more than a page on his CV, uh, except just to mention that he is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and uh, also, um, uh, a fel um, sorry, also a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science um, and the Institute of Electrical and e Electronic Engineers. So uh, the last thing I'll say about him is that as I look at his CV, it seems that everywhere he has been, he has taken an active and leading role in uh, uh, civic affairs. And I, I will just mention one example of that. He served as a member of the Christopher Commission, that is the Citizens Commission on the Los Angeles Police Department uh, in the wake of all the horrors surrounding Rodney King. And this was a real moment of, of uh, transformation for the LAPD and for Los Angeles. Uh, and that's only one example. So John, um, I'll ask you now to talk about your career and say what you want about it. And uh, then we'll just throw it open. Okay, well, thank you, Greg. Uh, after listening to uh, you describe um, some of my journey, it made me realize why my mother said I can't keep a job. <laughs> uh, I think you had too many at once, John. <laughs> <laughs> well, as, as you pointed out, I, I, I uh, let me give you a little background. Um, I grew up in Topeka, Kansas. I attended the pre Brown verse of education. Um, black elementary schools, four black elementary schools in Topeka at the time. My, my sisters and I um, attended uh, one of those four um, at the time when the schools were still segregated. Um, the elementary schools were segregated, but the junior high and the high school that we attended were integrated to a point we could participate academically, but could not uh, participate socially in those, in those institutions. Um, in the eighth grade, I decided that I wanted to be an engineer. I'm not absolutely certain how I made that decision, except that I like to tinker with uh, with devices, I took my bicycle apart once a week, put it back together again, just to see how it worked. Um, my dad was a, among other things, um, was a used furniture salesman and he would buy uh, old radios and things from an auction house and bring them, to, um, bring them home. And I began to play with them and I began to fix some of them. And at a point, um, my dad uh, decided that, that uh, maybe um, he could help me. So he built me a radio shack in the backyard and I went into business. I uh, used to say that I'll repair any radio in Topeka for $4 plus parts. So that's how I got my start as an electrical engineer, really. Um, when I went to high school, um, 
I told everyone within listening distance that I wanted to be an electrical engineer. But at that time in history, black and brown students were not encouraged to do things like engineering or science. Um, and consequently, without my being aware of what was going on, I was placed in a vocational track and um, learned how to, to uh, repair radios and television sets and things of that sort uh, in a, in a uh, complete way that I had not been able to do it when I was tinkering. Um, so when I graduated from high school, I had uh, excellent grades, but I, I had not taken the courses that I needed to uh, enter engineering school. So when I applied to Kansas State and the University of Kansas, I was denied admission because I lacked the science and math that I really should have had in high school. Um, I was fortunate enough to receive a small scholarship from a small liberal arts college in, in my hometown, Washburn University. And there I took the courses that I should have taken in high school. In addition to that, I took courses in economics and speech and um, history, world history, American history, English literature, and a number of other courses that uh, engineering students uh, normally did not take. And even though I thought having to go to the liberal arts college to make up for the courses that I should have had in high school was a um, was a something that that uh, was unfortunate. It turns out over the long run that it was one of the best things that ever happened to me because I had exposure to fields and disciplines that I would have never had had I began uh, my education um, immediately as an engineering student. In Topeka, Kansas, if you said you wanted to be an engineer, that meant you wanted to run the Santa Fe Railroad train because there was no such thing, or at least I was not aware of any engineers in Topeka, regardless of race. Um, so when I went to Kansas State uh, after two years at Washburn, uh, I was able to complete the electrical engineering curriculum. And as Greg pointed out, um, my first job after graduation from K-State was uh, with General Dynamics Convair in San Diego, uh, where I went to one week after graduating from high school, be graduating from college, because uh, my only goal at that time was to get a job. Um, fortunately, my wife-to-be uh, was also coming to San Diego. She had graduated um, with a, a teaching degree. Um, and so we, we uh, married uh, in, in San Diego in 1956. Um, I spent four years, four and a half years in various positions um, at General Dynamics until I um, decided to joined the Navy Electronics Laboratory in, in San Diego, where I spent 14 and a half years, um, beginning as a relatively low um, grade engineer and ultimately becoming a department head, um, um, sir, um, having management responsibility for over 250 people. During that 
process while I was at General Dynamics and in my first um, six months at the Navy Electronics Laboratory, I was completing a master's degree um, from UCLA, um, working um, full time, but uh, going to school in the extension program from UCLA. Um, I decided after getting my master's degree that I would never go to school again. Um, this was not something that I, that I really had in mind doing anything more uh, academically. I think, frankly, as I look back upon it, the reason that an academic career was never in my mind, because I had never seen in my college experience at any level, an African-American um, as a faculty member. And consequently, um, it just had not entered my mind that it was a, a possibility or even something that might be of interest to me. But during the time I was working for the Navy and, and having an opportunity to advance, um, I had um, some mentors um, who guided me um, throughout my career there. And one of them was a, a, a department head um, with whom I became um, um, a very close friend. And on one occasion, I said to him that uh, when he retired, I wanted to um, apply for his job. And he told me very directly that if I was to do that, I had to go get a doctor because he was the last person who would ever serve in that role, in his opinion, without a doctoral degree. So that's when I um, began um, my PhD program at the University of California at San Diego. But I was working full time at the same time, and I had a small group of engineers and technicians, about a dozen of us, who were working on digital control systems. And we did some of the early work in digital control systems because we were one of the few establishments that had um, a digital computer. Um, at, at our um, at our service, most universities and and organizations at that time um, had digital computers, but they were used primarily for data processing purposes. But we were fortunate to have a computer that we could use um, in our experiments, and we. We, uh, as I said, did some of the early work um, in how to use a digital uh, computer um, as a um, um, controller of large machinery. And that was the effort that really made me realize that this was a field that I wanted to um, wanted to um, be a member of. And also it made me realize that I, because I had this small group of people um, who were excellent in, in, uh, in, their, in their efforts, I came to the conclusion that I really preferred to work with people rather than with things. I wanted to help a group of people set some goals, give them the resources to accomplish what they wanted to do, and then get out of the way and, and let them let them achieve it. And so that became my my uh, approach to management. Uh, to be uh, uh, to use the same word that uh, Jeanette used earlier, 
to be a cheerleader um, and to encourage people to pursue their goals and to assist them wherever I could, but not hinder them from accomplishing and uh, from accomplishing their aspirations. The success of our work at the Navy Electronics Laboratory uh, was what led uh, me to be recruited by the University of Washington to lead the Applied Physics Laboratory of the university. The Applied Physics Laboratory was, had been established during World War II um, by the Navy and it continued to do um, primarily work supported by the Navy on underwater vehicles, underwater acoustics, um, fisheries, um, and anything having to do with, with the oceans. Um, and I was there um, from 1975 to 1977. Um, and at that point, I was contacted by the Carter administration to come back to the National Science Foundation um, as the Assistant Director of Astronomical Atmospheric Earth and Ocean Sciences. I spent two years uh, in, that, in that position, but I was not happy um, at NSF at that time for a variety of reasons. Um, one of them was the fact that I was concerned of, about um, the disparity in the way in which the historically Black colleges and universities were treated as compared to predominantly white um, research institutions. The funding for the HBCUs and the minority serving institutions um, was handled differently than it was for, for predominantly white institutions. The, when the proposal came in from, from uh, those minority institutions, it was not treated with the, in the same way that uh, proposals from, from uh, PWIs were treated. And, and I felt that this was unfair. Um, and because I, I was disappointed by that and several other things at the foundation at the time, I, I accepted um, the offer to come to back to the state of Washington to Washington State University as its academic vice president and provost, a position that I, I thoroughly enjoyed. It was really my first real um, academic uh, position. Um, it, was, it was different than just running a laboratory. I had a larger set of responsibilities and I, I uh, learned a great deal about how colleges and universities operate. But during that time, um, there was a change in the directorship at NSF. Richard Atkinson, who had been the director when I was assistant director, um, was appointed chancellor of the University of California at San Diego. And he recommended that I replace him I was reluctant to do so because I had been at uh, Washington State for such a short period of time. But I received a, a phone call from, from the president who urged me to consider, even though I had, I had uh, been reluctant to respond to calls from the personnel, White House personnel office. And so when, when President Carter called, that, that, that uh, caused me to change my mind. And so I accepted the, the uh, offer to be considered 
to be nominated for the directorship of the National Science Foundation. But as I'm sure you recall, uh, 1980 was a time when President Carter was up for re-election and um, the, the uh, Republicans in the, in, in the Senate um, were hesitant to approve any of Carter's nominations because they were um, confident that uh, Ronald Reagan would become the next president. So consequently, uh, I, I uh, was concerned about whether or not the position would, would uh, continue, that, that the offer would continue to exist if the, the administration changed. I was the last Carter nominee to be confirmed by the US Senate. But even after confirmation, I hesitated to, hesitated to go to Washington because I wanted to make certain that I was not going to be, be uh, eliminated by the new administration. But um, fortunately, the, the uh, senators, um, Republican senators, whom I had known during the time I was assistant director, continued to support me. So I, I did become director of, of NSF. That was a difficult time because the Reagan administration had um, different priorities than the Carter administration had. I found myself in a situation where almost as soon as I arrived, as director, I was faced with eliminating the science education and the behavioral and social sciences programs because they had been stricken from the budget um, that was presented uh, to the Congress by the Reagan administration. And so for the time I was at NSF as director, much of it was spent trying to restore those programs. The one really positive thing that happened during, during the time I was director of NSF, uh, I was able to um, establish the direct group for engineering. Engineering up until that point had been a part of the mathematical, physical sciences and engineering direct group, but uh, still, uh, under the umbrella of the of the sciences, but uh, a year after I was I became director, we were able to announce the the formation of the engineering directorate, which uh, I think made uh, professors of engineering throughout the country very happy. So that was that was the. Mostly po most positive thing that occurred during my time. Fortunately, um, we were able to continue our efforts in getting the behavioral and social sciences and science education reinstated. Um, and so it was on a path to being reinstated when I was asked by the University of Maryland to become the chancellor of its flagship campus. I spent five and a half years at Maryland. Um, I sometimes tell people that, that uh, it is an indication of change to realize that at the time I graduated from high school, I could not have attended the University of Maryland because of my race. And 30 years later, I was its chancellor. Um, that is an indication that society can change. We've not made as much progress as perhaps we should, but clearly we have made some. 
the experience in Maryland was was uh, was one that I look back upon with with uh, a lot of satisfaction. We had some difficulties. Um, the most significant one was the loss of a uh, very talented basketball player, Leonard Bias, from a cocaine overdose. Um, he had been drafted just uh, a day before by the Boston Celtics, number one draft choice. Um, but when celebrating with some of his teammates, uh, um, he took some cocaine, which was laced um, with something that caused him to have a heart attack and he died. That placed the university in a very, very difficult position. And I, I spent the better part of a year in dealing with the, the outcome of that very, very um, sad situation. Um, in 1988, um, I was contacted by an Ivy League institution to consider um, being um, a candidate for president. Um, again, I was somewhat reluctant to, to agree to be a candidate because I was not confident that the school was truly serious about the possibility of adding, of having um, an African-American president. At that time, there had never been um, an African-American who, who was president of a, of a uh, private um, institution, let alone an Ivy League institution. Um, and it wasn't until I um, was convinced by a member of the search committee that I even went through the, the interview. But during the interview, the chairman of the search committee asked a um, student member of the, of the committee whether or not um, the university um, was ready for an African-American president. And she was shocked by the question. And she said, of course it is. Well, I decided that right at that point that the questioner was not ready. And so I declined further consideration of serving as candidate. A few months later, I received a phone call from the same search firm saying that Occidental College wanted me to, to uh, be a candidate for president. But based upon the previous experience with the Ivy League school, um, I decided I did not want to go through that. And so I said no, and, uh, and I meant no at the time. But they were persistent. And uh, um, finally, when they asked if I would be willing to come out for an interview, I said, no, but I will be willing to be interviewed here in, in uh, the DC area. And so they sent the chairman of the search committee to, to uh, Washington, uh, Washington, DC. And we had um, lunch together in in Georgetown, and it took me only a few seconds to realize that they were serious, that they were not playing a game, that they were not just looking to say that they had um, uh, an affirmative action uh, candidate. They really wanted to find a, 
a president who could help them take Occidental College um, into the future. At that time, Occidental was um, a school that was under stress from some of its faculty and students because they wanted to become a more diverse institution. But so as Greg pointed out, they were one of the institutions that was not quite sure how to do so. Um, and when I came out uh, for the interview, I was asked by I was asked by the one of the members of the search committee if I thought the board of trustees, which was comprised almost wholly by white businessmen with very little academic experience. Um, I was asked whether or not I thought that that board of trustees was uh, the right kind of board to lead Occidental into a more multicultural future. And my response was no, I did not think it was the right composition. I thought at that point that I had really killed my chances for becoming president. But on the way um, back to the airport with the, with the uh, head of the search firm, um, he began to laugh. And when I asked him why he laughed, he said, because you're going to be chosen as the next president. I said, why do you say that? He said, because every other candidate that they've asked that question have said, yes, the composition is fine, but they know that it is not. Um, and you were the only one that they know gave an honest answer to that, to, the, to that question. And so not long after that, yes, I was offered the, the, uh, the role as president. I spent 11 years as president of Occidental. And uh, it was without a doubt, one of the most wonderful experiences of my professional life. I, I enjoyed coming to a liberal arts college, focusing on undergraduate students because I had long felt that far too many um, major research universities concentrate too much on graduate education and research and not enough on undergraduate. So I had a chance at Occidental to spend time with undergraduates to get to know them um, and to um, help them in any way that I could to guide them um, through that process. Um, after um, 11 years, um, I retired from, I, I, I put retired in parenthesis because I think I've retired three or four times. I retired from uh, Occidental and um, I was asked by Gib Hensky to come to USC and uh, teach uh, leadership classes and, uh, and, and other classes. Um, I spent uh, I spent a year at USC before being asked by uh, the National Action Council for Minorities in Engineering in New York to come there as president and CEO. I could not turn that down because uh, I, throughout my experience, had become very concerned about the paucity 
of minority students in the field of engineering. And the National Action Council, which is called NACME, um, was and is an organization that is the largest private supporter of scholarships for minority students in engineering. And so I could not turn down that invitation to come back and lead um, NACME. And so my wife and I moved to, my children had already graduated from college. And, um, my son was in Baltimore, my daughter was in Virginia. Um, and my wife and I um, came to the New York area, lived in Manhattan for a year and then bought a home in Connecticut uh, where we lived for nine years um, before um, I um, retired from NACME. Upon retirement uh, from NACME, I wrote um, um, Max Nikias, who was provost at USC at the time, to let him know that I was coming back to Los Angeles. And if there was anything that I, I could do at USC, I would be happy to do so. Very frankly, I would have been willing to volunteer. I just wanted to have something to do. But uh, um, Dr. Nikias uh, um, asked me to come back, meet with various people, um, and um, both Karen Gallagher um, and Giannis Yorksos were very open to me joining their, joining their faculties. Um, and so I have spent the last uh, um, 11 years, I guess, uh, um, at USC and very, it's been a very enjoyable experience. I have uh, had an opportunity to do some things that uh, I never would have had an opportunity to do and to work with some outstanding people and to get to know so many of them, um, even those who are on this, on this phone call. So that sort of wraps up my wraps up my journey. I'll be retiring on on June thirtieth. Um, it uh, it has been a as I as I told uh, Dean Nogueira and and uh, Yorkos in my retirement letter. Um, I have long felt that the journey is more important than the destination. And uh, that uh, truly has been the case for me. So I will stop rambling here and uh, turn it back over to you, Greg. Oh, <clears throat> well, thank you, John. It's a wonderful story. And, and I, I was just enthralled. Um, and <laughs> uh, best wishes for your fourth retirement <laughs> coming <laughs> up. And I think we put retirement in quotation marks, right? <laughs> so I want to give people a chance to ask John questions or engage in, in uh, discussion with him. Um, if you do want to, please either uh, use the chat or the uh, raise hand uh, thing in the, uh, in the reactions menu. Um, so does anyone... I, I won't be able to see all the thumbnails. So if I start missing somebody, speak up instead. So don't don't hang back. Yes, Jerry. I think you're muted. Yes, John, hello. Uh, my question is, uh, was there anything or were there things with your engineering background that were of particular help to you in all of your different positions that maybe people who didn't have that background would not have been able to do? That's a good question, Jerry. I sometimes say that, that uh, an engineering background 
um, is a value in in uh, any situation that you find yourself in. There's no question in my mind, but what the engineering approach to solving problems was beneficial to me in some of the most difficult situations that I found my, saw myself because uh, uh, as you well know, we, we uh, engineers uh, um, try to assemble all the information they can, um, try to understand the boundary conditions, the constraints that uh, that are under when they deal with the deal with the problem, um, and then after gathering all that information, proceeding toward a solution. And I and and I followed that path in the uh, most difficult situations that I had. So yes, I think uh, um, I'm not saying that uh, someone else would not have reached. Uh, um, the same or better uh, conclusions than I, regardless of their background. But I, I think that approach helped me um, see through the fog and, and focus on what needed to be accomplished. Thank you. Others? Have, <clears throat> anyone have question, comment? Well, if, let me, uh, so I'll, if I could try one, John. Um, oh, sorry, Gib. Well, uh, thanks, Greg. I'll, I'll, uh, John, good to see you. Good to see you. I'm, and I'm, I'm sure you'd say it's good to be seen, probably, right? That's it's good, really. Very fun, very fun. Uh, good to be seen it, and viewed. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, the uh, taking that journey over time and up to the present, uh, we uh, higher education, uh, along with many institutions in the country, have formally adopted. It goes by the the, the initials DEI and and diversity, equity, inclusion, and that's that's very public and very very prominent in in the conversation. As you look at it over the course of your journey and across these institutions, is that a is that an inflection point? Or is it? Uh, can you can you comment on that on the on the current on this current moment? Well, thank you for that question. Yeah, um, I sometimes say that uh, when I went to Occidental in 1988, um, the word uh, multiculturalism was considered a four-letter <laughs> word. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, uh, I had uh, trustees who left the board because um, they saw the effort to, to move in a direction that is now referred to as DEI. Um, They, they, they were not comfortable with seeing the school move in that direction, but it was very clear to, to me as well as many of the people at the college that it needed to make that transition and it needed to be serious about it. So it, the first thing we did was to um, do a strategic planning effort. And we, we ended up with a report one year later with the title of Excellence and Equity because uh, we believed that quality and equality could occur at the same time, that excellence and equity were not mutually exclusive. And this was not something that was commonly um, felt or expressed in academe. Many people felt that if you focused on equity, then you had uh, to suffer um, excellence 
And I have never felt that to be, to be the case, <laughs> even personally or, or within an organization. I believe that uh, one could have both. And I think we proved that at, at Occidental. We, we had more road scholars. We had three road scholars during the, during the 11 years I was there, which was more than, than many of the large research universities in, in, the, in the country. Um, while at the same time, um, they were a diverse group. Uh, one year we had a Rhodes Scholar who was a Romanian immigrant, a Marshall Scholar who was an African-American female from Harlem and a Truman Scholar who was from the barrio in, in East Los Angeles. And um, we trumpeted that and to use that as an example of why one does not have to fear um, diversification of, of an institution um, because uh, they think it might uh, be lesser in, in uh, quality. So I think we were 30 years Ahead of the ahead of the curve, very frankly, and uh, the very same things that are now um, being fostered under the umbrella of DEI um, um, were things that was not that were not being done in uh, higher education in 1988. So I'm very proud of the fact that, uh, as Greg pointed out. Uh, in 1989, U.S. News and World Report described us as the most liberal arts college, most diverse liberal arts college in America. Terrific. Uh, Mike, Mike Waterman, can I ask a question? Yes, please. Uh, John, uh, I, I really loved what you said about excellence and diversity at the same time. Um, and there's an incredible emphasis on DEI uh, today. Uh, I heard of some of a uh, chair candidate at quite a good university whose talk was entirely about DEI, not one word about excellence, not one word about academic vision. And uh, this, this concerns me. And, and uh, maybe the pendulum has to swing one way or well, the other to find the equilibrium, but no. That is concerning, Michael. I, I, think, it, I think one of the mistakes um, that is made in the example you just mentioned is, uh, is certainly an indication of that. I think one of the mistakes that we make is failing to tell the story in a way that points out that one does not have to um, discount excellence at the same time you strive to be a more inclusive Hello. organization. And um, how do you sound? If, if if we if we oh that's good. If we put those things um, in the right perspective, I think it would make it would make a difference. It may take some time to convince some people to be sure, but there is no question that in, in, in my mind and in the minds of, of many that, that one can have them both at their best um, by concentrating on making certain that, that we don't discount um, excellence at the same time we're we're striving to become a more just and inclusive organization. So I, I think that's the challenge that's facing higher education um, um, even today, because uh, that story is not being told um, strongly enough. John, if I may, um, as a Rossier uh, graduate, I'm and very curious. I've been working with students now for 16 years through the Emeritus Center. 
and you've been working with students for quite a while. Have you seen a change in the students and over the course of the years that you've been teaching and also um, any recommendations for higher ed as to how we can prepare um, students who are in, in any area of education for the future? Yes, I've seen, uh, I have seen some positive changes, Jeanette. Um, I have just uh, finished writing what I hope uh, will be an op-ed that the Los Angeles Times um, will accept. Um, and in that op-ed, I said that, that uh, the students that I teach today, particularly the undergraduates that I teach today, are the most intelligent, informed, and committed students to improving the world than any I've seen in the past. Um, and I have, I have become convinced that that uh, some of the issues facing the world today, uh, climate change, the impact of the pandemics, the social inequalities that exist, uh, the failure to deal with uh, race issues in an open and honest fashion. These are things that this generation this young generation and the generations that follow will be required to address, but they can't address them unless they have the right academic background. And I was speaking, of, I've been speaking about engineering students. Um, you recall earlier in my comments, I mentioned that I had taken some courses that engineering students don't normally take. And that those courses probably have meant more to me in the long run than most of the engineering courses I've taken because there's no question in my mind that I would not have been the president of a liberal arts college if I had not uh, um, had some of those, those uh, liberal arts and humanities background courses. And I'm convinced that engineering students, for example, um, must have a broader education than, than uh, certainly um, engineering students in my time had because engineering students in my time um, almost had no courses outside of math and science and engineering practice. And I think if, we're, if we are going to solve the problems facing us today and we will be facing tomorrow, a background only in science and math is not going to allow those students to be able to address them because all of those problems involve economics, politics, human concerns, fears, and aspirations. And unless you have sufficient background to understand those things, um, those problems are going to remain unresolved. And so, yes, I, I, I think we do need to examine how we're educating young people in the future. And we do not need to fear having the difficult conversations that, uh, that can arise when you take into account the human element into to any of these disciplines, particularly the scientific and engineering disciplines. Other questions, Jerry? Well, uh, John, my understanding is that the deans of engineering throughout the United States are backed into a corner by the National Engineering Education Association that actually accredits their schools. 
And uh, my understanding is that they, that association does not believe in leaving time uh, for students to minor in the humanities and social sciences. That's something you could take on in retirement. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm not uh, totally knowledgeable about what the accreditation associations are, are doing, but I think uh, engineering education um, needs to face a revolution. <laughs> Um, first of all, I think that, uh, and, and this is a, an opinion that perhaps not too many people have, but I think a, an engineering undergraduate education should probably take five years rather than four um, in order to, to accommodate the uh, um, courses outside of the normal engineering curriculum. Um, that's probably a non-starter, but uh, I really feel that we need to find a way to broaden the education of engineering students. I, in my op-ed piece, I say that, that no longer should an engineer design a bridge or a highway that goes through a minority or poor neighborhood without having stopped to think about the consequences that it will have um, on the residents who will be affected. Or no longer should an engineer design a building without adequate access for disabled persons, without stopping to think about the consequences. And so that means that, that we have to, to have people who are in these positions who understand the impact um, of their work. And you can't just uh, design something and, and uh, not think about who it is that's going to be affected. Thank you. Others? Um... I think Jeanette had a question in the chat. As you make the transition to another retirement, other than writing articles, do you have other passions to pursue? Well, uh, one, one of my hobbies, or my primary hobby is model railroading. And so I want to finish my railroad that I've, I've sorted. I'm sitting here looking at it right now and I've got the track down, but that's about it. So uh, in addition to doing some writing, uh, I'm, I'm going to work on my railroad and, and hopefully get a chance to see my kids. <laughs> that, sounds, that sounds wonderful. Um, anyone else have questions? Um, I guess I have one that I, um, you know, you. One of the arcs of the story you told us was going from a situation where you were even put in a vocational track in high school because it was assumed, that, and it was in fact the fact that you could not go to college because of your race. And yet you became president of <clears throat> one of the best liberal arts colleges around. And you said, that we've made a lot of progress. And you also said, but there's a long way to go. And I guess, especially in this time when, when affirmative action now is, is being, um, the future of that looks bad in the Supreme Court, when the discussion is so forced into that binary opposition <clears throat> between merit and, and race, merit and inclusion that you, you talked about so sensibly, I, I couldn't agree more. So what are, the, what are the obstacles that we still have to face? Or to put it more concretely, what would your advice be to a young African-American student just starting out 
what are the obstacles that person still has to overcome? Greg, one of the things that I say to young African-American kids who are going to high school or junior high is, uh, I have a very simple statement. I say, don't take no from a counselor. Um, My, based on my own experience, if I had been smart enough to realize that I was being directed a, on a path that was not going to lead me easily to my goal, I would have resisted. Um, uh, I was ignorant and unaware of uh, really what, uh, uh, what was happening to me. But now young people are much more alert, much more um, attentive, but they're still being told no. Um, and so I'm encouraging them to, to uh, not let that be a, a barrier. I, th I think um, all young people, not, not just African-Americans, but all young, young students have to begin to think clearly about uh, um, where their aspirations might lead them and make the decisions that um, will enhance their opportunities to do so and to not let artificial barriers prevent them from accomplishing what it is that they that they want to do. I have seen too many uh, young people fall by the wayside because um, they have internalized the, the uh, sense that this is not for them. And if you internalize that and begin to believe it, it won't be for you. But uh, I just want uh, all young students, and particularly those who have been denied opportunities or think they have been denied opportunities because of race or background or, or uh, gender even or, or other uh, issues. Um, I want them to realize that uh, to a large extent, it depends upon on them to do what is necessary to, to uh, try to overcome um, those barriers. Um, most of them are, most of them are movable, frankly. Um, um, and you just have to have the courage to, to go forward. Hey, it, anyone else have question, comment, anything? Well, um, so I, I want to thank you very much, John. This was really wonderful. It's, um, I think, in many ways, a very moving story and uh, very inspiring uh, to all of us. And um, I want to again, to wish you well in your fourth retirement, if I don't see you. And uh, really, thank you. I, I think I speak for everyone here. Thank you. We really appreciate your doing this. Uh, thank all of you. I thank all of you for coming. And also, I just wanted to, <clears throat> wanted to tell you that um, uh, Michael Waterman has uh, very kindly agreed to be our next speaker. And we've scheduled his talk uh, for... Tuesday, April 12th at 2 p.m. So I hope you'll all turn out for that as well and uh, make this a regular occasion. So thank you and have a wonderful weekend.
Thank, Thank you, John. Thanks very much, John. Thank you.